Hello, I'm today talking to Ken Kruger, designer of the Vashon Ranger, and Ken's in Washington, Washington State, that is. How are you doing, Ken? Doing well, Ian. Thanks. Tell us a little bit about your background. You know, I grew up with as a kid just loving airplanes, being exposed to flying, and uh, went to uh, university to study aerospace engineering and worked in the, the big airplane industry for a number of years, and then... You know, of course, while I was doing that, you know, wanted to pursue my flying and uh, aviation interests from that end of things. And so, um, you know, was a pilot when I was a teenager and bought an airplane at like 23 or 24, something like that. And uh, but and then uh, this guy was building an airplane in his in the hangar in my hometown. And so I got interested in that and happened to be an RV4 and, you know built an RV six while I was working at Boeing and um, then got another job after Boeing doing some STC work on airliners. And, and then um, just kind of on a whim, I sent a resume into vans and one night the phone rings and it was Dick Van Grunsman. And so we, we chatted, one thing led to another and I ended up <laughs> working at Vans for, Oh gosh, it's like 17 years. And uh, on the, RV, uh, not in chronological order, but in numerical order, the 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and the RV-14. And I was the chief engineer on all of those except for the RV-9. When um, when I got there, this uh, fellow by the name of Andy was the chief engineer, but he left shortly after, and then I got the the nod to do that. So, And then, um, yeah, I left Vans um, in just after Oshkosh in 2012 because I had the opportunity to – uh, go design the Ranger. And so that's been a, a an interesting and fun project. It was certainly a departure from working on, on RVs, um, you know, at a number of different levels, factory built versus home built, you know, high, just the basic configuration, a high wing airplane versus a low wing. And, and of course, just a different company culture and different design goals. The base model is like under a hundred thousand bucks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, Outstanding. Well, it might not be outstanding business, but it's an outstanding price. <laughs> well put. Um, yeah, it is. And in fact, that was one of the design goals to to make flying affordable. And, you know, there's a bunch of different ways that you can do that. Um, you know, and, and so, yeah, that was that was definitely a design goal. And there were other other design objectives as well. But it's a it is a a very difficult Thing to achieve, um, you know, coming out of the home, home built world, you you don't even think about it. The the assembly time, the assemb the hours that the the person builds a home built airplane with, they are free. The labor rate is zero dollars per hour. There's a certain amount of customer satisfaction involved with making a kit built airplane, you know, easier and more streamlined to build. But at the end of the day, the company that that puts out the kit does not pay for the labor to assemble it. That's not true with a factory built airplane. It's and so the labor hours are far more important than I had anticipated going in and and you know it's been quite a quite a learning experience. Did you start with a genuine clean sheet? Definitely. Yeah, it was it was genuinely a clean sheet. There, you know, what little I brought, you know, that was kind of the genesis. Of course, John Tarot, the owner of the company, who also, as folks probably know, is the owner of Dynon Air Dynon Avionics. Yeah. Um, you know, he has a certain uh, DNA also. And so there was kind of this, you know, joining of the Dynon DNA and a little bit of Anne's DNA and a little bit of things that I'd been kind of, you know, laying awake at night dreaming about uh, that kind of got all rolled up into the Ranger. So the, the John Road Ken Kruger, Immaculate Conception. <laughs> I suppose you could put it that way. I wouldn't call it immaculate, but yeah. So... So, so let's let's run through the design goals. Clearly, it had to be had to be low cost, re reduce the cost. Uh, presumably, it was only ever going to be a two seat aircraft. Yeah, because of the the reg so it was going to be an LSA. So the LSA, you know, getting into that regulatory environment of being an LSA means two seats. You know, a weight maximum takeoff weight limitation. Uh, you know, airspeed and. and you know, stall speed, airspeed, those sorts of things. So there's a lot of, of uh, boundaries or bounds put on the design right out of the box by being in the LSA category. 
Um, beyond that, of course, we talked about cost already. Uh, you know, it had to be factory built, so it's going to be easy to or quick to assemble. So all of the tricks that we all know to get airplanes to go together more quickly. Um, you know, using technology to uh, manufacture the parts and whenever possible, you know, do assembly, although we really don't have any automated assembly to speak of. Um, other, a fun uh, design requirement that folks, again, may, may or may not know about, but John is, John Tarot is a nut about seaplanes. Um, he has three airplanes, a Beaver, or a Cessna 180, and a Murphy Moose, none of which are have wheels. They're not even on amphibious floats. They're all on straight floats. And so he uh, uh, was adamant that, you know, the airplane had to be suitable for float uh, plane use. And so that um, drove a couple of different things. It drove the wing area and the wing span because we knew, hey, we've got to meet this 45 knot stall speed requirement at a higher, at the seaplane gross weight, which is 650 kilos. Um, that also meant, well, gosh, you know, if it's going to be a, a float plane, we're going to have to have a great big old tail on it. Uh, you know, and a lot of airplanes that go on floats, you see them with additional vertical tail area. Well, you know, we don't really want to do that. And, you know, that would be weight and cost that we didn't really want to have to account for and redesign, you know. So that drove a lot of why the tail is, is, is as big as it is. Um, we can go back to that. I think it resulted in a nice flying airplane. Um, the horizontal tail is also large, um, and the the float plane requirement, while not strictly driving the the, it definitely drove the high wing configuration. But one of the things that's unique about the Ranger is it's a it's a cantilever high wing, and that float usage, you know. So then you go, well, gee, high wing, should we use struts or or go cantilever? Well, of course, I know plenty about cantilever airplanes. Practically every low wing airplane in the world is cantilever, so it's not good, like it's any great mystery. Um, but as a float plane, getting rid of that strut just made life, you know, so much better. And um, so that that uh, was part of the the decision making process there. Uh, the doors also, um, you know, ease of entry and exit, but you know that's a big deal on a float plane. Um, our little, I call it like Marilyn Monroe's beauty mark that's very distinctive, but our pedo static AOA probe that extends the wing edge of the way. Yeah, you could call it ugly, but I think it's like Marilyn Monroe, you know, beautiful and distinctive anyway. Um, but that was also part of the, the seaplane requirement and, you know, it, it works as a land plane as well. Did you have to do the floats or did you buy the floats in? The goal, the long-term goal, is for Vashon to produce floats. Um, but the the air, the one airplane that we have on floats right now, it's tied up outside John's house. He lives on Lake Washington. Um, that airplane is on Edo floats right now. So it was just quicker to get us where we needed to be. The most efficient place to get to where we wanted to be was to buy a set of Edo floats and put them on the airplane. Well, let me just see if I can switch to the uh, to the screen share. If we look, if we look here, I'm um, just looking at the kind of construction. Are, are they match drilled holes? Or? Yeah, they definitely are are match drilled holes. Um, uh, they're not drilled. They're punched. They're produced. The almost all of the sheet metal parts are produced on a turret punch press. Um, and so, yeah, like a like an RV kit and mini kits, mini sheet metal airplane kits today that it's got the all the holes and all the parts is how I describe it. Um, and we did take that uh, concept a little bit further. Uh, one of the uh, you'll notice that the airplane's base color is white, and that is because the the material, the metal, raw sheet metal comes in pre-painted, uh, which is pretty revolutionary. Um, I, I don't think it's without precedent. But it's it's definitely unique, and so the the sheets come in painted. Of course, that is in the interest of saving assembly time, saving weight, and saving cost. Um, so that's one unique thing about it being a you know one sheet a distinctive sheet metal airplane. Another interesting thing that we were able to accomplish is that we dimple the sheet the thin sheet metal material on the punch press machine. So there's tooling that comes in and forms dimples at each hole location. And that really, again, is not super revolutionary. You know, that happens on in different places, you know, rare, a few different places on an RV kit, for example, and I'm sure it happens on other sheet metal airplane kits. 
that's easy for the skins, but you know, the fun part is we do that for the spars and the ribs and everything else. So the, the holes uh, that get dimpled, they get dimpled on the machine and we figured out how to do the subsequent bending operations without smashing the dimples flat. So uh, that was kind of a fun, fun little application of, of uh, teamwork and thinking and, you know, making things happen. But yeah. Look, looking at that, and looking at the door here, they're, they're flush rivets, which is why they're dimpled. Yes. How much of a debate was there around stuff like, well, why would we even dimple it? Why don't we just leave the rivets protruding? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and there was there was that argument, or I shouldn't say argument. I, I mean argument in terms of yeah, yeah. making the case for something. Um, and after being going through the RV12 experience, you know, being the design part of the design team of RV12, and then of course, you know, getting hands on and you know, being near it, touch it, feel it, taste it, kind of thing, live with it for a while. I'm I find that the protruding head rivets, even when you go to to wash it, um, you know, the the hit rivet heads are getting in the way. If you want to put vinyl trim on it, the rivet heads are uh, you, you know, they're in the way you have to work around them. Um, and I would say if, if it were hand dimpling that we were, was our only choice, it probably would have been a protruding head airplane. Uh, but since we can get those dimples happening on the, uh, on the machine, you know, you're already, you're already going to the store to buy potatoes and milk. Hey, let's pick up, pick up a six pack of beer while we're there too. So that's kind of the, the thinking. I'm always up for an airplane that picks up a six pack of beer. <laughs> yes. And and the um the rivets, presumably you can buy rivets with a particular color of white already on them. Correct. Yeah. The rivets, I you know, I didn't know this, but again, the beauty of a team environment is that the the other team members were able to find a place where you can get pre-painted rivets. The doors are absolutely huge, which is which is a good thing. But I presume from a is that I mean is are there structural issues around making doors so big? That that pillar, what I guess would be an A pillar in a car, looks quite small. Yeah, um, and you know, on the list of things that kept me awake at night, that was one of them. Um, we do have that A pillar. It's a steel tube, so it's it's uh, three quarter inch by three quarter inch steel. Um, that forms that guy. Um, and then we also have the V brace, which is covered with a, a black fabric, nylon fabric, but you can discern it in the photos. Just about see it in there, I think. The yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, we're using a very strong material for that, that A pillar. Thankfully the A pillar is loaded primarily in tension, but in general, uh, that was one concern with it. The V brace provides some good uh, diagonal bracing, so we can get some good torsional stiffness there as well. That was another big uh, concern that I had with, you know, with having the great big doors. If you, if you hadn't have had the floats, would you still have had to have the V brace? <sighs> you know, I don't. I don't know. We haven't flown it that way. I can tell you that for all of our static loading uh, tests. We did not use the V brace um, in those tests, so I know that the the A pillar itself is strong enough to take the tension loads, and the the uh, and in fact the worst load the the worst load case for as far as putting tension on one of the the A pillars is actually an asymmetric load uh, loading condition uh, that puts the worst tension. Of course, we've got the negative G loading, which puts the worst compression on it. But in all, for all of those load cases, we did not have the V-brace in, in place. And I could say, well, we don't need it, but I, I, I feel good having it there. Moving on from a, from a non-engineering aesthetic point of view, um, I suppose you might describe the interior of the Ranger as um, economical. I mean, for all LSAs, it must be similar. There must be like a really quite a tight weight budget that you're working to. Uh, and in this case, cost budget as well. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Um, it, it is very sparse or Spartan. I might use use those terms, and those are totally fair terms. Um, one thing you'll notice 
one of the things that we knew right going in, we did have that weight budget. We do have, we do have the, the cost budget. The other thing um, you mentioned earlier, Ian, is the, the O200 engine, which is unique among LSAs. And yeah. the reason it's so unique among LSAs is because it's a heavy engine, com- uh, particularly compared to a Rotax. And so, you know, it's a blessing and a curse all at the same time. And so the reason I mention it in this context is just, you know, we were already at a disadvantage for weight. So we had to just, you know, go simple, go basic. Um, one of the things that I like about the Ranger uh, and the door is a, is an okay, is a good example of that is compared to say, and, and I'm not picking on RVs, but are, I'll just say compared to a kit built airplane, you know, if you hop into one of those, there's a lot of open structure inside a typical, a typical RV. And what, we did with the Ranger is much like the door has two, an inner skin and an outer skin. It provides some additional strength. So that's why it's there, but also uh, provides a way of closing it out, making it look a little bit more tidy. And you'll see those closeout panels throughout the interior of the airplane. And so we got double duty. We got kind of a clean look, even though it's just sheet metal, but we also got some structural benefit as well. Talking about the doors, one of the other nice features, and I hope I'm not stealing your thunder here. One of the things that I've noticed about uh, doors uh, on some airplanes is that you, you know, you have to close it with one hand while you're holding the handle and then you latch it and then you, you know, whereas your car, you just hop in, you close the door and you go. And that was, there were two things about the door that I was very adamant about on the design was the first one was, hey, if the door is unlatched, it's a non-event. The door stays attached to the airplane. The door is stable. You just fly the airplane. Whereas others, you know, door comes unlatched and it's gone. If you're lucky, it's just gone. If you're not so lucky, it may hit part of the airplane on the way out. Um, So that was the first one is doors must stay attached and be stable if they come unlatched during flight. Um, And then the second one, which (laughs) leads to the other question, since you were in Florida, can we fly it with the doors off? It looks like the, the size of the opening that would be left if you flew it with doors off, looks like the aerodynamics might. Be, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an aerodynamicist or an engineer of any kind, but it looks like there's a bloody big hole for some air to be messing around with. <laughs> that it is, yes. I'm not super excited to try it myself. But the second one uh, was, of course, that like your car, you just hop in, you close it, and and away you go. There's quite a lot of screen, isn't there, which gives it a a unique aesthetic look. Yeah, there's a lot of glass. Um, it has kind of a, a very steep windscreen, which you know it's not. It, I would I would characteristic characterize it as a smart looking airplane. I would not call it sleek, utilitarian maybe I should say. Yeah, form and function type thing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's. A, I think uh, look, let, let's let's. I, I personally, I absolutely love flying it. It's probably the nicest LSA aircraft I've flown in terms of for handling. It was just lovely. It felt really solid. It felt good. It, 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 there was no qualms about it whatsoever. Some of them you fly are horrible in pitch, and some of them you open the door and you, the door flexes so much that you think it's about to rip in half. And you know, not not all of them, but there are some there are some extremes in the LSA world. And this one was just a really, really nice, solid aircraft. So having paid it all those compliments, if there was a beauty contest for LSA aircraft, it would probably not quite make the final if you were just judging on looks alone. Agreed. Um, but, you know, like you said, it's it's a really nice, tough, it's a really, really nice flying aircraft, and it just feels tough. I mean, the undercarriage, that looks pretty chunky. Yeah, um, I would say, you know, design requirements and design, how the design requirements played out. Um, it's got, so what we're looking at in that photo are 606 tires. Yeah. Uh, and those are big tires. Well, 606, that's the same size as on a Cessna 182 or um, uh, a PA28, for example. They have, yeah. and, you know, so that's not particularly big. Well, yeah, but this is a 600 kilo airplane. So those are big tires for such a lightweight airplane. And yeah. it, that gives us a lot of stroke because the tires deflect under load. 
Um, it gives us a lot of good rolling uh, clearance, you know, to be able to roll over bumps and, and, you know, mole hills and things like that. So the, right out of the, right out of the shoot, the, the big tires help us a lot and they contribute to that kind of beefy look. And, and the main, the main gear is. The main landing gear leaf spring is a, uh, a autoclave cured composite uh, part. And uh, again, that seems very unique, but it really is not because the, the uh, Grumman American, the AA5, the AA1 and the AA5, the, the uh, what do they call it? The Traveler or Yankee and then the, the Cheetah and Tiger. Is yeah. Jim Beatty uh, kind of a design is it's just a piece of, we buy uh, sheets of, like I say, autoclave cured um, GRP graphite or a glass reinforced plastic. And then it gets cut out to the shape of our leaf and, and then it just gets bolted into the airplane. So it provides, it's a good spring because it, it absorbs energy. It's like a diving board, really uh, absorbs energy. It's simple. It's simple as dirt to install and to manufacture. And it is well damped as well. Looking at that nose wheel, that, that's, that's a little bit beady like as well, isn't it? Is, is beady an influence? Um, yeah, I think that's very fair. Um, Although I would say it's BD via the RV world, you know, all of the Trigear RVs have uh, castering nose wheels and, um, you know, and many other airplanes, quite honestly, Cirrus, uh, Glaster. Cirrus has got some BD DNA in there somewhere. I must say that Ed's photography did, uh, did justice to the look of the airplane. I mean, he made the airplane look as good as it can look, I think. So, so talk, me, talk me through this then. All right. So that is our... Uh, multi-function protuberance that lives on the wing. Again, we have it up uh, high and out of the way, mostly for the sake of the seaplane. So if an airplane, if a seaplane pulls up to the dock, the wing is hanging over the dock. Uh, we wanted to have it up the pedostatic pito AOA and fuel vent up high enough where it, it wasn't going to become a weapon. Yeah. Um, Interestingly, you mentioned the the Skycatcher. Interestingly, one of the complaints about the Skycatcher was that it had the pedo in a place where people would walk into it, and it was about eye level. So, you know, there was some danger there. Of course, we wanted to avoid that, and so it works well also for a um, for a land plane uh, to have it up that high. Um, well, how can I inspect it? I have to be able to look in there. I'm going to have to have a ladder to, to get up there and look at it. And I would say, yeah, you're also going to have to have a ladder to get up and look at the fuel. So you are, you already got a ladder. And in fact, when you're up looking at fuel, you can, we have, uh, pedo AOA in there. Okay. That's pretty normal. We also have the static ports are on that probe yeah. and, and the little, the little piece of tubing that you see hanging down is also our fuel vent. You know, by the time we put the pedo and static up high, pedo static AOA up high, well, it's like, well, now I've got a place to put the fuel vent and it vents the fuel, you know, outside of the shadow of the airplane. And so that worked out really well. The fuel system is um, interesting. We've got a lot of fuel. We hold uh, 28 US gallons of fuel altogether. Uh, we have the two wing tanks and then they gravity feed into a, a, a header tank that two and one half gallon us gallon header tank that's um uh under the glare shield on the right side of the cabin usually a header tank is pretty small we've we've made it so that the header tank has two and a half gallons which is your vfr reserve so if there you ever get to a point where the header tank is not full then you know hey I, i'm below my my vfr reserve well how would you know if that header tank is not full we have a little float switch in, in it, and as soon as it goes not full, you get a red light on the EFIS that says fuel. And every airplane comes with dual brakes. Wow. Every airplane comes with a two-axis autopilot. Every airplane comes with all of the lighting. Um, the only thing that that $100,000 airplane does not come with is a second screen. One of the things that I, I'm going to talk anyway, sorry, Ian, <laughs> but... Um, one of the things that I that we we again are paying a weight penalty and a cost penalty for is not only just the fact that they're dual brakes and dual rudder pedals, but the fact that they are adjustable. Well, that's no big deal. Lots of airplanes have adjustable rudder pedals. Um, well, yeah, but these are independently adjustable, so you can adjust the front side, you know, one side way forward for a tall guy, and you know the the other side back for 
you know, someone who's a bit shorter or different body proportions as well. And I think that that's one of the nice, it, it's a nice feature. Did you guys have a typical customer in mind when you were building this? Uh, yes. Um, it, it was, we really are trying to, to hit a lot of different cost segments of the market. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about multi-role aircraft, you know, the um, F-35 is a multi-role airplane, uh, you know, the F-18, you know, German Luftwaffe just bought a bunch of F-18 Super Hornets and, you know, it's a bomber, it's a fighter, it's a tanker, it's a trainer. Uh, you know, so you, we wanted to, to hit a lot of different markets. Okay. We wanted to be into, uh, individuals was a big part of who we were after, uh, with the, the O 200, very traditional engine, you know, there's a segment of the market that just really isn't, isn't super excited about the, the, uh, Rotax engine. So we felt like we could capitalize on that O 200 engine, um, Individual pilots and owners, of course, the pricing would make it available to individual people who just want their own airplane. So there's kind of that sport flying market. Um, by making the cabin so large, uh, you know, we can fold the seats down. You can sleep in the airplane, you know, go camping, kind of adventure, you know, the big tires and big wheels. I have to say, I'm not convinced that many people sleep in airplanes. <laughs> I've done it on two different occasions and have been very comfortable. Um, but that's I'm that I am a bit of an oddball, so we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, the other we uh, of course also want to go after the flight school uh, market as well. Do you think there's any chance that that the engine options? Might, I mean, you guys are building your own engine, aren't you? Um, that is read something about that somewhere. It the, it's in development, um, and it there is an engine in development. I think that's. Uh, public knowledge. It's a long and arduous process. Um, and so I, you know, I, I applaud John for having that vision and wanting to, uh, you know, develop an engine, but it is not a slow, it's not a fast process. That said, you know, I've, I myself personally have lobbied to, to consider a Rotax engine. And we have heard that feedback from a number of, of potential customers. In terms of manufacturing, how complex is the manufacturing of the, the Bastion? How much, how much massive investment in jigs or something is there? Relatively little investment in, in jigs or, or fixtures. Um, it's interesting that the, the jigs and fixtures that are there are really, they're not there for alignment necessarily. They're there just to hold the pieces while the people are putting parts on them. And uh, so in that respect, it's, it's minimal. Um, of course, the, um, the CNC manufacturing machines, a mill and a punch press um, and a press brake, uh, those are pretty, um, you know, there's a big investment in those tools, but those tools, be it a mill, be it a press brake or a turret punch press, they're incredibly flexible tools. And so the same machine can produce almost every part in the whole airplane. I mean, that's a, that's a slight exaggeration, but they are, you know, that's the beauty of some of these uh, CNC machines, which are relatively common, uh, you know, in places around the world, you know, sheet metal shops are, are practically everywhere. So, so I think it would be very feasible to, to produce the airplane in another location would, would it be suitable for, for making into a kit um i would say i hate to say this but i would say no um particularly in a place like the uk um you know here in the u.s we have people with big shops and you know there's all kinds of room and people can work and uh you know do things but the ranger with its particularly with its one piece wing uh that's 20 or excuse me yeah that's almost it's nine meters span um there that's going to be really awkward in a home builder's shop um in, in in fact you can see there's no dihedral to the wing um and again it was designed from the get-go from the beginning with as a as a uh 
factory built airplanes. So that one piece wing, you know, the weight requirements, ease of assembly, simplicity, you know, they all pointed towards that, that one piece wing with, and when you have a one piece wing, it makes it hard to put dihedral in it. So, you know, that's, that's the first thing I point to that would make it kind of unsuitable for a, a home built, for a kit built airplane. In terms of the, um, the, the lack of dihedral, Again, just have a little wander into aerodynamics 101 here, if I may. Okay. And forgive the stupid questions. So the, the dihedral provides a certain amount of stability, uh, as I understand it. Um, but but this is a very very lovely, sweet handling airplane. Um, and you could you, you I, I don't know. You could look at it and go, well, why does anyone bother with dihedral if you can if you can make this without it? Why would you bother with it? Yeah. Um, you know, again, list of things that kept Ken awake at night, uh, during the development process. One of them was the, the no dihedral wing. Um, the purpose of dihedral is to have what we call roll due to yaw. So when you st stomp on the rudder, uh, you should get some roll effect, pro positive roll. So if you punch right rudder, you should get some right roll with it. That's actually a certification requirement that you have have that, um, and so a high wing airplane naturally has dihedral effect, um, whereas a low wing, uh, because of the interaction of the wing and the fuselage, uh, it helps a high wing airplane. It hurts a low wing airplane. So if you look at a low wing airplane, they uh, they all have dihedral to produce that roll due to yaw effect. Um, the other thing, uh, some high wing airplanes have the vertical tail relative to the wing real high. And if you can, you can kind of even see it in this photo, you can imagine that as the rudder is deflected, say to the right, you know, kind of the center of that action or force due to deflected rudder in the case of the Ranger is actually below the wing. So that's going to produce some uh, pro uh, rudder yaw pro rudder roll, excuse me for that. Whereas, you know, some high wings, uh, that the tail's way up there and you can see that that would tend to work against giving you roll due to yaw. And then of course, a, a low wing airplane between the, the wing fuselage interaction and location of the vertical tail, you know, you've got things working against you. So <laughs> I hope I didn't go into too much detail. No, no, no it's absolutely, absolutely fine and, and fascinating stuff. But you know, like I said, very, very sweet handling airplane. Yeah, it works for us, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What's the future for the for the Vacheron? Is this this production process? Um, but I can tell you that um, you know there's been talk of a follow-on product, and and um, but I you know if I'm wearing my if I'm speaking for Vacheron aircraft, I I won't go beyond that. I will you know for me personally as an airplane designer, I've got. Um, I think a fairly fertile little imagination. Um, so I've got lots of ideas. But. So the cooling looks quite minimal to me. Is that because you live in a really cold place? <laughs> it could be. Um, if uh, it, yeah, it seems to be adequate. One of the pleasant surprises with the airplane is that the speed, even without the wheel fairings, this. I was surprised that that we're getting, you know, 115 knots, 100, 115 to 117 knots at um, at our 75 percent cruise at 8,000 feet. Okay, Ian. So maybe you don't like to sleep. the idea of sleeping in the airplane doesn't appeal to you very much. But um, the other thing that I've done is I bring my full size mountain bike in the airplane, and the only thing I have to do is take the front wheel off and and lower the seat, and in she goes and you know, I've got my airport transportation with me when I when I land and want to go grab a bite to eat. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you. It's been thank a pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you sometime, hopefully in September.